Hello everyone and welcome to lesson 12 of our online missionary preparation class today. My name is Jimmy Smith um, and I'm here with my two kids, two of my kids anyway, my oldest Hannah, second oldest Abe, and uh, we're going to be going through lesson 12 of the church's mission prep class. Uh, this lesson is about finding people to teach. So very crucial and important topic for missionary work, obviously. Um, before we get started, just a little bit about me. Here's a picture of, uh, of me and, and my wife and our six kids. We live in Texas. I served my mission uh, in Argentina back in 1995 through 1997. It was a great experience. And uh, so I'll be telling you a story from, from my mission uh, a little later. Um, so we'll be following the church's missionary preparation manual. I'm teaching these two guys and just recording it for everybody else to watch who might be you know, stuck at home because of COVID-19 and, and, or, or other reasons. You can't get to uh, one of the official church sources for this class, then you can watch this video. But please do remember this is nothing official from the church. Please have notes ready to write down inspiration that you might receive from the Holy Ghost. Um, just a quick review of past lessons. So uh, this is the 12th lesson we've done. It's a 15 lesson series, so only three more after today. Um, we started off with lesson one, talking about the purpose of missionary work, inviting others to come unto Christ. Then we talked about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Then we talked about learning and teaching by the Spirit. The role of the Book of Mormon, preparing for life as a missionary. We spent two lessons teaching about the message of the restoration, and then a lesson about developing Christ-like attributes, and then two lessons about teaching the plan of salvation. Uh, so that was lessons one through 11. They're all available on my website and on my YouTube channel uh, and, and in the podcast. So you can go back and watch or listen to those. Today we're going to be talking about finding people to teach, which as it says here on the screen, in, uh, the screen, it's an indispensable prerequisite to sharing the gospel. You have to find people that you can teach, <laughs> or you're not you're not gonna can't, not gonna get far. Can't teach people if you don't have people to teach. Yeah, you no. have to have people to teach people. So um, finding people to teach requires faith, a lot of faith. Faith to talk to people about the gospel, which you might uh, think, of course, missionaries talk to people, but that's actually a challenge for a lot of missionaries, and we're going to talk about that. Faith to watch for opportunities to teach and testify, and faith that God will lead you to the people who are prepared to hear the message of the restoration. So um, I wanted to start off talking about the first time I ever talked to somebody um, on a bus in Argentina. Now, um, on my mission, we uh, did not have bikes, we did not have cars, we walked everywhere we went, and we could also take public transportation, like city buses. And most of the places I was at uh, uh, had had a, a decent uh, public transportation through through city buses. So um, we would uh, we would from time to time, you know, probably once a day. If we needed to get a long distance across our area or get somewhere fast, we would take a, a bus. And uh, I remember I'd been in Argentina for a couple weeks, and um, my, my Spanish was uh, not very good. I mean, I had two months in the MTC, but I, it was still uh, pretty poor. Uh, my companion was a native Argentine, so he spoke perfect Spanish. Did he speak English? Uh, yeah, he spoke pretty good English too. That would have been funny. Yeah, I think he was trying to learn English as, as from the missionaries and, and, um, during his his mission. Uh, so he spoke uh, he spoke English much better than I spoke Spanish. I'll put it that way. So um, anyway, after a couple of weeks, uh, one night we were working late, and it was like on the we were on the other side of our area. It was it was. Um, um, you know, nine or nine thirty, and so we needed to get back to our apartment. So we decided to take the bus back. And my companion we said, "Hey, tonight's the night. Today's the day. You're going to talk to somebody on the bus." 
Because I'd let him do most of the talking, of course, right? Because I was a green missionary. Mm -hmm. So um, he said, we're going to sit down by somebody on the bus, and you're going to talk to them. And I was terrified. Uh, and so, so we got on the bus, and um, I, I followed him, and he, he saw somebody, and he sat down in such a way that where... Um, I, if I recall correctly, my companion sat right behind this guy, and he like indicated, "Hey, you need to sit down by this guy on the bus and start talking to him." <laughs> so I was a, a, an obedient junior companion, and I sat down next to this guy, but I was terrified. But eventually, I opened my mouth and I said hello, and I tried to strike up a conversation with him and tell him in my broken Spanish that we were representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ and had a message about. The savior we wanted to share with him and he was super nice to me i mean he could probably tell i was a foreigner and and but i was just i i, I was afraid it was going to go so horribly bad but the guy was super nice and receptive and um i asked hey can we uh, you know when, when, when it was time to get off the bus i asked him if, if we could write down his name and phone number or or, or or address so we could contact him and follow up and have a more in-depth discussion and he said yeah sure and uh, and so, so I took, wrote down his name and, and uh, address, and uh, I, I don't remember if we ever saw him again. Um, a lot of times people would give us false addresses. They would give us an address and we'd go there and like they didn't live there or the address didn't exist at all. So I don't remember uh, anything coming of, of this, this guy, but I was, I was glad that he was at least super nice to me because... Um, if if he had been you know mean or rude to me, I don't know if I ever would have wanted to open my mouth again to talk to somebody on the bus. But uh, it, it was it was a good experience, and and throughout my mission, um, whenever we saw somebody in the street, we passed by, we said hi, we talked to them about the gospel. Whenever we, we rode a bus, we sat down, we struck up a conversation, we tried to explain that we were missionaries, and ask if they wanted to hear more. So um, so that was my my experience. Uh, uh, talking to someone for the first time ever on, on the bus. So now I'm going to fast forward about a year and a half into my mission. I, 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 I was in a city uh, called Concordia, Argentina. And um, my companion, uh, Elder Sanchez, and I were walking down the street uh, and we saw a man standing on the corner waiting for a bus. Uh, so we, we went and uh, talked to him, uh, as we frequently did. Like I said, you got to open your mouth constantly. So we were walking by, we talked to him, and, and he was super nice. And, um, but, you know, a minute or two after we started talking to him, he's like, oh, here's my bus, i got to go. So we said, hey, can we write down your name and address and, and come talk to you more? And, and he said, yeah, yeah, sure. My name is such and such Juan or whatever. I don't remember what he said his name was. And then he gave us an address and we, we wrote it down. And uh, we said, well, so can we come by to, you know, tomorrow around 11? And he's like, sure, sure, that'll work. And so he got on the bus and took off. So the next day we um, go to look for Juan and we, we, we find the address, you know, whatever it is, one, two, three, uh, Elm Street or whatever the uh, the uh, the Argentine uh, equivalent is, but anyway, so we we um, we quickly realized that it was a false address because we were looking at the numbers on the road. He said it was you know like one two three and like all, all the all the numbers were in the thousands or something, and there was no one two three or you know it was clearly a, a bad address. So we were we were wandering around where we thought his his house would be. Um, and uh, we didn't find it, <clears throat> but we, we uh, scanned the air, we looked around, and uh, uh, there was a man uh, named, uh, uh, I can't believe I forgot his first name. I should have written it down. It, his last name's uh, Lescano, the Lescano family. Maybe it's uh, better that way anyway. But uh, so we saw this man uh, standing there working on his brick house. Well, he had, he had a house and he was at doing an expansion. He was working with brick. He was doing the brick and the mortar, putting it together. He was out in his yard working. So we went up to this man and, and it was this guy right here, uh, Brother Lascano. And um, anyway, we, he, he wasn't a member of the church at the time, 
So uh, we went up to him and said, hey, uh, senor, uh, we're looking for 123 uh, Elm Street. Do you know where that is? And he's like, yeah, that's, that, that, that number doesn't exist on, on this street. And so like, he just confirmed, okay, we, the, the guy just gave us a bad address to, to you know, get rid of us. Which will happen a lot as a missionary, so just, just be prepared for that. But anyway, he was super nice and friendly, so we struck up a conversation with him. We told him we were missionaries from the church. and um, Oh, this isn't the guy who gave you the address? No, the guy who gave me the address. Never saw him again? We never saw him again. He, <laughs> was, he was just trying to get rid of us. That was he, a big he, lead up. With yeah. Them. But like I said, when we were looking for the, the guy, we ran into Brother Lascano. And, and um, we, we explained that we were missionaries and we had a, a, we called a charla corta, which means a short discussion. So we just, in, in you know, five or ten minutes, we explained basically the principles of the first discussion. Uh, God and Jesus, Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and so forth. Um, and uh, we asked if we could come back and teach a full discussion later to his whole family. And he said yes. So we came back another day. They're super awesome families. You can see four kids. They I, they would have us over for dinner. We had discussions. They were just wonderful, wonderful family. They uh, um, came to church as soon as we invited them. I remember it was a state conference the first time we invited them to church, and they came and they to state conference, and they loved it. And um, anyway, just a wonderful family. Um, and like a week before their baptism, I got transferred. So mm -hmm. I didn't get to be there for their baptism, but this is a picture of their baptism. Brother and Sister Lascano. Which one's the new missionary that had just come? Any guesses? The one on the right. Yeah. <laughs> he, was the, he was brand new, I think, from the MTC. Like, I don't know these people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is Elder Sanchez, my companion there. Anyway, so... Could you still go? No, I was several hours away. I mean, it, that, it, they, it, this this city was on the very edge of, of our whole mission, and so I was I was many hours away. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but I talked to Elder Sanchez um, later. A few months later, I ran into him at a zone conference, and he, he, yeah, he he gave me this picture of, of their baptism. So mm -hmm. um, nowadays, they let missionaries correspond more like if you get transferred you can still write emails and such to the people you were teaching and baptizing mm -hmm. and so forth uh, so there's there's a lot better things in place nowadays but anyway the point of the story is all about finding people to teach you always got to be opening your mouth um, and uh, exercising that faith that god will lead you to the people who are prepared so we exercise our faith by opening our mouth and talking to the guy on the corner who you know, not maybe, prepared. Yeah, he wasn't prepared, and he maybe even thought he was leading us on a wild goose chase. But he led us directly to the Lescano family, uh, and so it just kind of shows. Nice. Yeah, God's in charge. He knows what he's doing. He's going to help you find the people who are prepared to join the church and to follow uh, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. So, um, let's get into the lesson now. Uh, three major sections of the lesson. First, we're going to talk about developing faith to find people to teach. Then we're going to talk about the importance of members in missionary work. Uh, and then lastly, we'll talk about how we need to use all the tools that God has prepared, especially or including uh, modern technology such as the internet and social media. So let's first talk about Wilfred Woodruff's mission to England. Back in the, the early 1800s, mid-1800s. So we're going to read um, some quotes from him. And as we read them, look for what he did to find people to teach. Hannah, will you read this paragraph? Mm -hmm. uh, Elder Woodruff asked the Lord in prayer where he should go. He recounted, I asked my Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ to teach me his will in this thing. And as I asked, the Lord gave and showed me what it was showed me that it was his will that I should go immediately to the south of England. I conversed with brother William Benbow upon the subject, who had lived in Herefordshire and had friends still residing there, and much wished me to visit that region of country. Excellent. Abe, will you finish the story by uh, Elder Woodruff? Elder, Elder Woodruff recorded that in one hour after I arrived at his house, I learned why the Lord had sent me there. 
I found a company of men and women, some, uh, some 600, who had banded together under the name of United Brethren and were laboring for the ancient order of things. They wanted the, gos they wanted the gospel as taught by the prophets and apostles, as I did in my youth. Elder Woodruff's companion, William Benbow, said it was a happy privilege of seeing his brother Ben John Benbow and all his household baptized into the new and everlasting covenant. Excellent. I'll finish it up. So Elder Woodruff uh, later recalled, uh, the first 30 days after I arrived in Herefordshire, I baptized 45 preachers and several hundred members. We brought in 2,000 in about eight months' labor. That's so many. Yeah, crazy. Uh, successful. Uh, 2,000 people in eight months. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, later, he wrote, The whole history of Herefordshire mission shows the importance of listening to the still small voice of God and the revelations of the Holy Ghost. The Lord had prepared, had a people there prepared for the gospel. They were praying for light and truth, and the Lord sent me to them okay so let's pause and discuss for a minute what did elder woodruff do to determine where he should go to find people who were ready to hear the gospel um, do you remember what he did he prayed yeah. he prayed <laughs> it's that simple he prayed god where should i go and uh and what did the lord say he told them where you should go he he showed me he didn't say how he showed me but somehow the lord Showed him that he needed to go to the south part of England, and he and and he also I should you know just conversed with his his mission companion, and they said, hey, Herefordshire is in the south of England, and I have some friends there. You were gonna say? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So, in what ways did the Lord assist Elder Woodruff? Show Think him about where that. To go. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Showing him where to go, giving him a companion who was from the south of England and so forth. Uh, so what do we learn from this story? We learn that the Lord can help us find people who have been prepared to accept the gospel when we pray for help, listen to the Spirit, and then act in faith. Which is exactly what Elder, then Elder Woodruff, future president of the church, would do. So uh, let's talk about the family of God. Hannah, will you read this quote from Preach My Gospel? Mm -hmm. All people on the earth were members of God's family in the premortal life. We are part of God's family in this life and, in can, and can enjoy even greater blessings as members of his family in the life to come. We are all brothers and sisters in the family of God. This knowledge gives us a sense of identity and belonging. It gives us a reason to hope for eternal life in God's presence. We understand these basic truths because of the restoration. Teaching restored truths to your brothers and sisters is your responsibility and blessing. Excellent. And Abe, will you read th this? This um, it oh, was not in I the manual, know. believe it or not. But uh, about a year ago, President Nelson spoke uh, at the NAACP convention. And he talked about the same theme, about how we're all part of the divine family of I God. I spoke at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good video. You should look it up. Um Abe, will you read this quote mm -hmm. from President Nelson? A fundamental doctrine and heartfelt conviction of our religion is that all people are God's children. We truly believe that we are brothers and sisters, all part of the same divine family. Together we can ex extend this love to all God's children, our fellow brothers and sisters. Excellent. And, uh, I'll read this. So this is uh, in Alma. Uh, as you recall, a few months ago from our um, Come Follow Me lessons, he was seeking to help his uh, apostate brethren, the Zoramites, and this was his prayer. He said, O Lord, wilt thou grant unto us that we may have success in bringing them again unto thee in Christ? Behold, O Lord, their souls are precious. Therefore give unto us, O Lord, power and wisdom that we may bring these, our brethren, again unto thee. So let's uh, pause and, and uh, uh, discuss and ponder on a couple of questions. So how does this doctrine that all men and women are part of God's family, how does that influence your feelings about finding people to teach? It can be anyone. It can be anyone. Does it? Oh, it makes it more like meaningful, I feel yeah. like. 
Yeah. Like you have more of like a desire to help them because like you love them, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We're all part of the same family. We love each other. And, uh, and that's excellent. So uh, in the quote from uh, Alma that we read, what did Alma pray for as he preached to help the Zoramites? Wisdom. Power and wisdom. That's, that's a good point. Which is what we'll need to find and teach and help bring people into Christ. We'll need wisdom and we'll need power to enable us to do that. Excellent. All right, Hannah, will you read this quote from the Preach My Gospel manual? Mm -hmm. You are to build up the church by finding them that will receive you. Such people will recognize that you are the Lord's servants. They will be willing to act on your message. Because these people have been kept from the truth only because they know not where to find it. Yeah, it's a couple of really good scriptures embedded in that quote. One is the DNC 42.8 that says, we're supposed to find and teach them that will receive us. Okay, mm -hmm. so we don't need to focus on people who aren't interested in the message. We need to find people who are interested. Uh, and then that scripture from DNC 123, which is fantastic too. That there's so many in the world who are kept from the truth simply because they know not where to find it. Okay, Abe, will you read uh, these three verses from DNC section 100? Uh, Therefore, I, the Lord, have suffered you to come into this place. For thus it, it was expedient in me for the salvation of souls. Therefore, verily I say unto you, lift up your voices unto this people. Speak the thoughts that I shall put into your hearts, and you sh shall not be confounded before men. For it shall for it shall be given you in that ver in the very hour, yea, in the very moment, what you shall say. Very good. So I didn't introduce this very well. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Joseph Smith and I think it was Oliver Cowdery were traveling on an errand from the Lord, and they were away from their family, and I think they were feeling a little homesick. Um, but the point is, wherever you are, wherever the Lord sends you, that's where He wants you and needs you. And the Lord was saying, "Hey, there's people here that I want to hear the gospel." And he, the Lord was reassuring them and, and telling them once again, you got to open your mouth and it will be giving you what you should say. Like, you know, me on that bus, the Lord helped me know what to say in the very moment that I needed it. Um, and I'll read this quote about finding by the Spirit from the Preach My Gospel manual. It says, finding by the Spirit is as important as teaching by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. As in teaching, your efforts in finding will be effective if you are guided by the spirit have faith that you will know what to teach and what to do to find those who will receive you all right and hannah will you read this uh other quote uh about uh, not being discouraged when people don't accept the message this is from preach my gospel as well mm -hmm. when people choose not to learn more about the restored gospel your work is not wasted your consistent consistent efforts in serving and teaching as many People as you can are the one way God prepares his children to eventually receive his servants. He often, he often reaches out to his children through you. Even when people do not accept the opportunity to learn the gospel, your service and words are evident of God's love for them and may plant seeds that future missionaries and members of the church will harvest. Mm. Harvest. Not harvest. <laughs> yeah. Important point there, planting seeds. As a missionary, you do a lot of seed planting. That Maybe you're not going to harvest it but other people will all right so let's um that's probably why it's important not to be so worried about how many baptisms you have exactly more than like people that you reached out to yeah you, you have to have confidence that whatever you do is what the lord wanted you to do even if you don't baptize a lot of people that you've opened your mouth that you've shared the gospel that you've been a good example have been a light and, and, and done your best and um, the lord will accept your offering uh, let's quickly go through these questions. What are some challenges missionaries face when they're trying to find people to teach, Abe? What do you think? What, what's challenging about finding people to teach? Well, so, oh, go ahead. Well, first, if you're just afraid of talking to people, just nervous, that's one thing also. So nervousness can be a challenge when you're trying to find people to teach. Yeah, Very absolutely. Anxiety, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Hannah, what are you um, any, any other Probably challenge? their willingness to listen. Some people probably are just... Yeah. More, more they want... Either they don't care or they're like 
just trying to tell you what they believe that contradicts that, like Bible bashing kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times missionaries get drawn into this, you know, conversations that really aren't going to be productive because the people don't want to learn; they just want to argue. You, yeah. you that'll happen a lot. And I think you alluded to the fact that a lot of people are, are just going to be in a hurry and busy, or just it's not on their mind, not something that they think about, and just they're not going to want to talk at the moment. These these are all challenges missionaries face. So how can a missionary maintain a healthy attitude even when people decline to hear their message? Because th this, um, this is a big deal. You're going to have to do this because you, you go on a mission. You get really down. People cl slam the door in your face. It's easy to get um, discouraged. So what do you do to stay, stay with a good attitude? Well, you can think about the good times and the people that have listened even if it's like just one person like hang on to that mm -hmm. and like the spirit that you felt with them mm -hmm. yeah and then probably like praying for like strength yeah i think you have to work on that relationship with your heavenly father and jesus and and they'll they'll strengthen and comfort you and let you know that, that you're doing all right so how does finding them that will receive you affect the way missionaries work i think we've kind of talked about that is we don't need to try and force our message on people we just need to invite if they want to talk great those are the people we want to talk to uh, and finally what should missionaries do when they do not see immediately the immediate results of their finding efforts just be patient patience you definitely need patience in your long suffering just keep going and that can be really hard but just you know uh, for me I, I found it you just, even when you might be a little discouraged, just follow the missionary, the rules, the schedule in that missionary handbook. It says to get out the door by whatever it is, nine or 10 o'clock, obey that, get out, be finding people. Keep doing what you're supposed to do as a missionary, be in the right place at the right time, and you'll see the Lord will open up uh, doors for you. So uh, let's transition and talk about the importance of working with members or member missionary work. Uh, Whose turn is it to read? Yours, Abe? Sure. Okay, go for it. Now is the time for members and missionaries to come together, to work together, to labor in the Lord's vineyard, to bring souls unto him. He has prepared the means for us to share the gospel in a multitude of ways, and he will assist us in our labors if we will act in faith to fulfill his work. Very good. That's President Monson. Now is the time for members and missionaries to work together. All right. Hannah, will you read this one? The ideal situation is when members invite others to be taught and are present for the teaching. When members do this, more people are baptized and remain active in the church. Association, association with members is important because it softens people's hearts and often leads them to learn more about the restored gospel. This often means that they are brought into the circle of friends of church members. And I'll read this quote from President Hinckley on the importance of members and missionaries working together. He said, so many of us look upon missionary work as simply attracting or door knocking. Everyone who is familiar with this work knows there is a better way. That way is through the members of the church. Whenever there is a member who introduces someone, there is an immediate support system. The member bears testimony of the truth of the work. He is anxious for the happiness of his friend. He becomes excited as that friend makes progress in learning the gospel. Abe, will you finish out this quote by President Hinckley? The member will bear sincere testimony of the divinity of the work. He will be there to answer questions when the missionaries are not around. He will, he will be a friend to the convert who is making a big and often difficult change. The process of bringing new people into the church is not the responsibility alone of the missionaries. They succeed best when the members become the source of the source from which new people are found. Very good. All right, Hannah, will you read uh, DNC eighteen? Uh, the, here in the title is, is verse 10, which is, Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Will you read? Mastery. Oh, yeah, for mm -hmm. seminary? Yeah. Yeah, we read 14, uh, 15, and 16, unless you have it memorized from, from no, that's seminary. Okay. We only no. have to memorize the principle. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not the scripture. 
Uh, Dean C. 1814. Wherefore you were called to cry repentance unto this people. And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring, save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father. <laughs> Sorry. Now if your joy will be great uh, with one soul that you have brought unto me into the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. I have a question. Um, is his bringing souls like unto him? Um, how broad is that? Because like, I feel like there's probably a lot of people who like reach out to a lot of people about the gospel, but they never like act on it. If that like maybe they aren't baptized, but mm -hmm. like they talk to them and like inspired them or something, but like. Does that count as bringing them to him? I, I think so. I mean... And some people, like... Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Some people, like, already, like, believe in Christ. And, like, I don't know. I mean, like, obviously I don't have all the, like, ordinances and all the truths. But, like, they, like, believe and love Jesus. And, like, you can find common ground with them. And, like, maybe they can find something from you. But, like, they're not immediately, like, converted. Like, yeah, um, well, I think God, um, as uh, Elder Holland puts it, everything counts. God, God is grateful for all those efforts. You know, I, I, I can remember uh, times where I've, I've talked to somebody who's a Christian but not a member of our faith. And just like I felt like we were talking about the gospel and really reinforcing one another's faith. Yeah. I think God loves that, and, and, and you know, especially, I mean, t from, a, from the mission prep perspective, I mean, the people that I introduced the gospel to and, and were baptized, and, and, you know, I hope I see them someday in the celestial kingdom. And can I take credit for them being in the celestial kingdom? Of course not. You know, they're great people, and they would have found the gospel eventually, and they would have accepted it. And, and they'd be in the celestial kingdom. But still, there's going to be this great love and friendship. They're going to say, hey, when, when we you know, meet in, in the celestial kingdom, oh, it's, it's Jimmy Smith, the guy who introduced the gospel to us. And the, the, the relationship's going to be there, and there's going to be so much love and connection. And, um, and I think that's what God's talking about in this verse. You know, I... I I happen to be the instrument in God's hands to introduce the gospel to them. And that's what he's saying. If, mm -hmm. if we can just be instruments in God's hands to bring people back to God's presence, then then our joy is going to be great. And it is going to be a great joy when, when we have these reunions in, in the next life. So hopefully that kind of yeah. addresses your question. All right. Um, this is uh, another scripture, DNC 33, verse 10 says, Open your mouths and they shall be filled. Um, let me read these other verses, 6, 7, 8, and 9. It says, quote, And even so will I gather mine elect from the four quarters of the earth, even as many as will believe in me and hearken unto my voice. Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, the field is white. All ready to harvest. Wherefore, thrust in your sickle and reap with all your might, mind, and strength. Open your mouths and they shall be filled. And you shall become even as Nephi of old, who journeyed from Jerusalem in the wilderness. Yea, open your mouths and spare not. And you shall be laden with sheaves upon your back. For lo, I am with you. So I did a Google search for, or not a Google search because I don't use Google anymore. <laughs> I did an internet search for sheaves. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I know what sheaves are. And anyway, I got this picture of sheaves of, you know, wheat. Or, Bundles of wheat. Yeah, that have been gathered together. So, um, anyway, that, that's the analogy here of, of reaping in your sickle, which is a, uh, or uh, thrusting in your sickle, which is an <gasps> instrument to reap the harvest and bring in those sheaves. Okay. Uh, Abe... Why don't you read this quote from uh, uh, Elder Ballard, President Ballard. Brothers and sisters, fear will be replaced with faith and confidence when members and the full-time missionaries kneel in prayer and ask the Lord to bless them with missionary opportunities. Then we must demonstrate 
our faith and watch for gospel opportunities to introduce the gospel of Jesus Christ to our Heavenly Father's children, and surely those opportunities will come. These opportunities will never require a forced or a contrived response. Uh, they will flow as a natural result of our love for our brothers and sisters. Excellent. And Hannah, we finish out this quote. It is impossible for us to fail when we do our best when uh, we are on the Lord's errand. While the outcome is a result of the exercise of one's agency, sharing the, the gospel is our responsibility. Trust the Lord. He is the good shepherd. He knows his sheep, and his sheep know his voice. <sighs> Sorry. And today the voice of the Good Shepherd is your voice and my voice. And if we are not engaged, many of many who would hear the message of the restoration will be passed by. Pray personally and in your family for missionary opportunities. Excellent. All right. So let's pause and uh, have a quick discussion. Why is the work more effective when members and missionaries work together? two sources of uh, yeah, uh, gospel and inspiration it's not just mm -hmm. one source mm -hmm. yeah I think also because it, it said one of the quotes was saying that like it helps them have a connection mm -hmm. and Absolutely. like a friendship Definitely. and so that that probably in some ways could feel like more genuine to the person being taught than mm -hmm. like missionaries like not that they're genuine but like that's their purpose in life at that point mm -hmm. and members like it'd be more like oh like we genuinely want it. right on i mean not that missionaries aren't genuine but no it, yeah it, it immediately makes a connection as you said and then I think they, they're more likely probably to stay they are statistically speaking i think way more likely to stay in the church it's an immediate support system i think president hinkley yeah. put it that way so why do you think some church members hesitate to talk to others about their faith they might be afraid that they'll reject them or stop being their friend or mm -hmm. yeah just won't respect their opinion so what can we do to have greater confidence to, and not worry about those things mm. pray maybe pray for confidence i think practice also yeah. i think you know uh, at my age, you know, I, I go to work and everybody knows my faith. I'm, I'm not shy about it. I don't think I'm preachy at all. But, you know, people people know I'm a Christian and, and people I've known longer or talked to more know particularly I'm a, I'm a Latter-day Saint. And, um, you know, when, when uh, moral or gospel or religious conversations come up, I, you know, I don't hesitate to... to to talk about my beliefs and so forth um and I, I think a lot comes that comes with time some people it's more naturally than others you know for me you know i, I do this mission prep website you know and and all the stuff online and, and and that's more natural for me for other people there are other natural ways to share the gospel with those around them and whatever whatever is your gift uh, and and propensity i think with practice and effort um, you can you can gain confidence in sharing the gospel that way. Uh, and just this last bullet point, just be thinking about this. What can you be doing now to invite others to learn about the gospel? Why don't you guys ponder that as we um, move on uh, to this quote from um, Elder Perry. Hannah, Hannah, will you read this? This was, I remember this, this was 2013. This was groundbreaking at the time so it was just seven years ago but this is when they authorized missionaries to start using the internet go for it what oh will you read that oh, please okay. yes uh when i was a young missionary we were able to speak with contacts on the street and talk and knock on doors to share the gospel the world has changed since that time now many people are involved in the busyness of their lives they hurry here and there and they are often less willing to allow complete strangers to enter their homes uninvited to share a message of the restored gospel. Their main point of contact with others, even close friends, is often via the internet. The very nature of missionary work, therefore, must change if the Lord is to accomplish his work of gathering Israel. Okay, Abe, will you finish that out? 
As missionaries enter this new age where they leave computers in the work of the Lord, we invite the young and the old, the adults and the, the young adults, the youth and the children everywhere, everywhere to join with us in sharing their gospel messages online. I wish to make it clear that we, what we as members are asked to do has not changed, but the way in which we fulfill our responsibility to share the gospel must adapt to a changing world. Very good. Very good. And um, honestly, I mean, we, we've been, we're recording this in November of 2020. We've been dealing with COVID restrictions since March. So that's what, eight months where missionaries almost exclusively have been sharing the gospel online through video conferencing and, uh, and social media and, and, and so forth. And so you kind of see how what they, the changes they made seven years ago to allow missionaries to use the internet more has kind of paved the way to where they are today, where that's almost exclusively what they have to do because physical contact is, is so restricted due to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. So, um, are they still like be pretty successful? The missionaries? Right now, yeah, the past like eight months. Like, like, I mean, I don't doubt them. It's just, it's a lot harder, I feel like, yeah. online, even though. I don't know, I haven't it. read anything from the church to say, are they, are they baptizing more? I think the missionaries are probably teaching, from what I've seen and read online, teaching a lot of people in kind of this, as they were before, just doing it all online. But is it as effective? Are they baptizing as many? I don't know. There's so many factors. I think I think uh, I think the missionaries and the church leaders are anxious to get back to missionary work in person again. Mm -hmm. But hope, but but it does I think illustrate what what can be done exclusively digitally and online. You can do great mm -hmm. great things to move the work forward. Um, and uh, and as this first the first question is, or what are some of the advantage of using online tools to share the gospel? Um, I There's think so many people like a diverse yeah well people yeah I've, I've read some great stories about people who've joined the church by finding some of the church's websites and, and chatting with missionaries online so um you know there's for for the world today as as brother uh, elder perry said you know the world's changing and we have to adapt and people are online and and that's how they're communicating and that's how we need to communicate with them uh, the gospel message uh, second question there, what are some digital tools you could use? So this is just something to think about. What could you use to share your testimony uh, and invite others to learn more about the gospel in your online activities? Um, and uh, I think we're almost done here. This wasn't part of the lesson either, but I thought it was really applicable to this lesson. This is from um, last month's general conference. Uh, President Nelson talked ab about uh, letting God prevail in our lives. And he asked some interesting questions uh, about uh, or, or applied that to our typical way of finding people to teach. Um, he said, uh, uh, quote, one of the Arabic meanings of the word Israel is to let God prevail. Thus, the very name Israel refers to a person who is willing to let God prevail prevail in his or her life. This concept stirs my soul. We often pray that we and the missionaries will be led to those who are prepared to receive the truths of the eternal of, of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've talked about that, right? But President Nelson says, I wonder to whom we will be led when we plead to find those who are willing to let God prevail in their lives. So I'll just leave that with you, let you ponder that. Of course, we want to pray to find people who are ready to receive the gospel, but an additional prayer that we as missionaries and members engaged in missionary work, an additional prayer we can offer is um, you know, how we can be led to people who are willing to have God prevail in their lives. And uh, when we find those people, I think President Nelson is saying the work's really going to accelerate and move forward. So... Um, just a, a couple of homework assignments and then, and then we'll wrap it up. So 
if you could, you know, find some time and write a few things in your journal, uh, things that you can do to help find people for the missionaries to teach. Uh, and you can prepare now for a full-time mission by sharing the gospel with your friends at school, at work, or online. Uh, prepare now by doing that. Start getting some practice in. And there's some great videos uh, about finding people to teach, which you can find on the church's website or, or YouTube channel, uh, such as the video called Developing Faith to Find. There's a video called The Lord of the Harvest, The Adams Family. And then finally, there's a video called Share Your Beliefs. So check all those out. Uh, I'll leave my testimony with you that I know what we've discussed today is true. Jesus is our Savior. This is His restored church. As missionaries, as we exercise our faith, we can find people to teach uh, about the restored gospel, invite them to follow our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know as we do that, we'll be blessed. And I leave that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So uh, thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. Please uh, visit the Latter-day Saint Mission web uh, site uh, at mormonmissionprep.com. Thanks, and see you next time. Bye.